Welcome. We're having a lot of fun here today. I'm with a dear friend, uh, amazing drummer, songwriter, all-around fantastic musician, Telly Keegy. Thank you for joining us so much. Thanks um, for having me, Don. And you're on the road traveling about as much now as you have been uh, for the last many decades, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. Probably 70, 70, 80, 90 shows, depending on the year. But yeah, we're still, uh, still out there rock and roll, and it's great. And yeah. that's with Night Ranger, of course, if you don't know. Uh, and going back through, you know, your history before you got with the band. Yeah. Um, give the, the young students out there a little bit of a background of what got you into drumming and uh, your educational background. Sure. Um, I, always, I always played in all, of, all the high school bands, um, but I never learned how to read very well. So, uh, but I learned how to listen very well. Uh, so I would listen to the drummers next to me, what they were playing, and then immediately in the next bar I would be able to you know do it so I had a good memory that way but that's not to say you shouldn't learn how to read because that's important but I just never did it was all about you know playing by ear and playing with um, other musicians and stuff like that so that was that and then the music that I was influenced by was probably like 50s 60s 70s rock right so it was about the the 50s artists like you know like I don't know Jerry Lee Lewis and you know you name it and um, you know stuff like that and and, uh, going, as your career went along, because we talk a lot about the importance of drummers being able to listen in the first place, yeah. to hear what the rest of the band is doing, yeah. playing for the song, having written one of the most iconic rock songs of all time yourself, Sister Christian. Um, Got lucky with that one? Think, think, oh, I think there was, a, there was a lot of years of, of background that probably prepared you for that moment. Well, that's true. I, I play guitar as well, so um, you know, that, that helped me with, you know, um, melodically. To, to, to figure out what songs were about, you know? And, uh, and it was always about the song to me, you know? Well, just before we went on, uh, we told an interesting story about, we're gonna ask you some of, some of your favorite fills, but tell me again and sh show me what you did on that fill with the, what, the, what, the, the, um, at the end of the song. The end, end of Sister Christian, it was, um, you know, it was like very late in the morning and I was, how, and let's a, a little bit of an experience. What was it like in the studio when you were doing that? Well, I mean, for, when we were recording our first couple of albums, we had to record after six because there were businesses adjacent to the walls. We wanted to record in a room like this, but it was a it was a it was a storage area at Alan Zent Studios uh, at the time. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but um, so we had to run the wires up there we went, we loved this big 35 foot room with bricks and well we were back there we had to record late at night so and, and it would become very early in the morning and i was just worn out you know and so at the end of that song after about 10 takes you know you'd always hear the you know producer go one more you know and i'm like i'm like oh my god i can't do it. you know and i'm one of those kind of drummers that i always feel like in the early takes, you know, you got good stuff, but you know, of course, they want to get as much material as possible. And the vocals you had already done, or you did later? No, this is just doing the basic tracks for that song. So, you know, we knew where the vocals were going to fit. I think I did a rough on there or something like that, just to be able to know where click verses. Click track back were. in those days. The click track you were working with. No or? click tracks. Yeah. No good click to, tracks. Good to know. So that's that's another thing. We were just all like kind of like in there going off each other's time hopefully live, I was close basically yeah basically live and then so but you know, on that particular song when we got to the end of it after I don't know how many, how many takes that whole ending just ended up being like a like saying to myself this is it this is the last one I'm ever gonna do and so I just played the fill and and there was this long pause and I expected the producer to go one more, and he gets his long pause. He goes, "Come on in." So that ending really worked for him. It was an emotional moment, and I'll, I'll show you how that goes. It was like, it's like say, um, it's like you know, we're going. My right. So that's the chorus, and I go, "You'll be all." Right, I remember it, and it was just like something that just happened. And then after after we did it, I was like thinking to myself, "Oh my God, I'm gonna have to play this every night." 
if we do this live. Much less for the next 30 years. Yeah, <laughs> you didn't I know. Think that, you didn't think that at the time. I, I embellish bet. it a little tiny bit, but, I'm, but I can't really. You yeah. know, I have to keep it the same. So that brings up some questions about, you know, where the world was then and where it is now in terms of records and record sales. And yeah, uh, yeah. let's pick that up in a second. But back to your career, uh, high school, you started playing in bands. Did you study, take private drum lessons, or I, did you self-taught? I took um, mostly self-taught um, just because I just copied, like I, I was talking about earlier, as I, I was like a sponge. Everything I heard, I tried to play. I mean, I was, my ability was, you know, not great. But it was all about singing at that point. From, from the beginning, I was a singer. So, you know, a lot of the guys, you know, that I was in bands with couldn't sing, so I just took it up, you know. And so I kept my parts super simple. Always you know? playing drums and singing? Or Always or playing out, and drums. Not out front and singing? Once in a while, I'd come out front, and I'd be in a band for like two weeks, and uh, there'd be another drummer, and, and, uh, and I'd be out front um, acting like Jim, and Jim Morrison or something like that, you know, because I'm from here. But... Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I played in bands, and it, it was all about the song to me. So whenever I got behind the drums and I sang, I kind of felt like, and, you know, where the phrasing had to be drum-wise and also vocally. And I always remember um, listening to some of the older singers and how, like Sinatra, he sings like a sax player plays. And I heard that comment from Quincy Jones. He said... If you listen to how Sa uh, you know how Sinatra sings, he phrases like a like a sax player, and I thought that was that's brilliant because that's how I, I would love to be vocally. So that was the challenge for me is to have to not you know some drummers like to go you know they want to play the same thing they're you know or sing the same the same thing they're playing. It's like I won't do this. I can do this. If you can't improvise both. You got to work on that. So, I mean, that's not the easy thing to do is have the phrasing be soulful and still keeping time. And, and so that's always been my challenge with, a, with my whole career is to try and make it the vocal soulful and keep time with a, with a great it, groove. It's know? a whole new level of independence. Uh, it really is. Because you're right, because we teach a lot of drummers, you know, one, to be big listeners, to hear what's happening around them, yeah. two, to listen to what they're doing. Yep. And you do naturally kind of want to sing what you're playing, hear what you're playing and sing it, do that. But it's you can't so do that right. and be the saxophone player at the same time. Uh, they would kill do, you. Doing two jobs, you're doing two <laughs> jobs, meaning the vocalist version of the saxophone player, because um, you're doing literally two things, you know, at one time. Yeah, so, I mean, so that's always been a challenge for me is how to, <laughs> you know, um, one uh, transfer from recording in the studio and then making making your performance be soulful live and a, a little bit different not perfect like the record so that's always been the thing for me is I always I mean that's it's a struggle for me when we first go out and start playing new songs is how am I gonna do this and sing you know because I sing on every single song I see either backgrounds or lead so yeah that's that's always been the thing for me but growing up with all those great the great music you know from Hendrix and the, and the Doors and all that stuff. And I always tried to sing all that stuff, too. So, you know, some of that stuff was challenging, you know. I mean, uh, It's interesting because one of the early things that we encourage drummers to do once they get to the point to where they're like in an intermediate level is to simply be able to play and carry on a conversation yeah. uh, at the same time. Because then you, what you're doing on the drum set has become, you know, uh, part of what you're thinking. Um, it's, it's, it's the coordination and the independence of doing it. You don't have to think about what you're doing. You're doing it automatically, yep. then you can carry on a conversation. Um, that might be an interesting first step towards them being able to do that and then being able to... Well, I tried... I, I understand what you're saying. I, what I tried to do is I tried to... Uh, I tried to sing everything that I heard, like Beatles songs or whatever, and I tried to copy it and play. So that was the same thing as having a conversation because a lot of times the vocals aren't really in time, you know? Um, so that, that was like, you know, um, you know tr trying to think about a Beatles song. I mean, like, look at Ringo sang a song called Boys, you know? And it was like... I've been told to It was like all those all those breaks and everything. It's like, how do you do that 
keep time in your head, sing the vocal with some sort of emotion. So, I mean, that's where I learned how to play and sing is him, hearing him do wow. Live at the Hollywood Bowl. And, he, and it was a great performance, and he was playing some, some really complicated stuff back then. So it was like, I mean, I was like, I want to do that. You know, I want to figure out how to do that. So People forget about that when they think of Ringo as a drummer, that obviously he sang on background and, and sang lead on several of those songs. Yeah, uh, he did. He did. When, in, when you got with the band, uh, talking about your recording experience, and I want to touch down on what kind of life in the studio back then and the way it is now, and probably one of the biggest differences is, correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, I think one of your first records went to a million sales. Was that your very first one? For the first one um, sold a million Copies? eventually. Okay. Second one sold two, and the third was a million and a half. And so, we, so we got up to about 17 million records in the, in the first 15 years of our career. So we're very, very lucky, yeah. And, and, uh, well, very talented, too, I might say. Um, and I remember meeting you the first time, bringing a, a pedal to one of your early gigs. Yep, uh, at the Palladium uh, in 1983, I think. And, and I was a, a, poor, a Pearl endorser at the time, and you came up with a, with a chain drive pedal, and you said, you know, you just would, were so polite, you know, and you said, hey, do you want to you know, try this out? What do you think, you know? And I was like, wow, you want me to try? Oh, it's, well, it's not a Pearl, but what is this? <laughs> It's like, and it changed your eyes, the spot, the sprocket, the whole thing. So I took it home. I, I don't think I ever told you this. I, I think it was like two or three week span where I didn't, didn't yeah. communicate to you if, if I liked it or not. Yeah. Because I was ha struggling with it because I'd been with one pedal for like 10 years. And then this was a, a, a new feel, but, but I had never attempted to do some things on the Pearl as I did with the with the DW and eventually had a breakthrough about, about th three weeks in. And I was, I was stunned at some things that like, like the whole, you know, like doing that, you know. I couldn't do that with that pedal. I couldn't bounce off of my heel and do it, you know. So, so that was a total breakthrough with, with the DW pedal that I couldn't do with anything else. A uh, story came up a little bit earlier today, which, I don't remember myself, but uh, remind me, because it was kind of a funny story. When Chris, you were at a gig, and my son Chris was, oh, yeah, yeah. was, was traveling with you, not literally as a drum tech, but. I think, I think it was John Good and yourself said, you know, you need to get some experience, son. So to, to, why don't we put I, you on I, the I road with, that, yeah. with, with, uh, with Kelly? Because we were just doing a small uh, club tour on a new version of Night Ranger. And so you put him out there, and um, it was it was amazing because so we did this whole setup and we practiced for you know I think we were uh, at Third Encore rehearsing for the tour and had this whole setup and you know Chris came in and was such a pro he's like so good at what he did and he, we got all the hardware and we got it all locked down and everything taped and the rugs and uh, this and that right at so rehearsal just, ready to go right. ready to go we shipped the stuff out out to Miami and the stuff got ripped off. On the, so you're there at the first gig. With so we, we got in the bus, you know, pulled around to the cargo area and said, you know, hey, we got these tickets. And they're like, we don't have it, you know, with a, a drum set and hardware, right? And you should have seen your, the look on your son's, you know, it's like, oh, my God, I got to call home, right? <laughs> Guess what, you know? So, and we, and we thought, um, you know, and they said, oh, yeah, you know, it's probably on, on the next flight. Well, it was like, we're going, we're leaving now, you know? We can't wait. There is. And it never showed. I don't think you guys ever got no, that No, it never showed up. I have no, we don't know to this It's day. like, you know, the Miami, like, uh, uh, you know, squad down there, whoever, like, retrieved it ahead of time. Somebody's playing that drum set down somewhere. there. Some, <laughs> somewhere. So, but, um, yeah, so, we, so he started with that. That was the beginning of the tour for him. So it's like we threw him into the fire, like, okay, man. Uh, we got a, you know, he started making calls. He got like some of the local, uh, you know. Shops to get some kits, some yep. drums together. Yeah, right, right. got the drums and the hardware together. And the first gig, he had to like reset up everything. And w that was like a two and a half week tour. And um, I think he, so I, he was I, under I, the uh, under the gun. gun. That, that was that a good point. way to learn, yeah. I think that was maybe his first and last. I think he retired from being a drum tech <laughs> after that. <laughs> I know, and, and, and I think I, I might have drove him crazy yeah. on that one too. I mean. 
So as the years went by in the studio, as young drummers have the opportunity to record and go in, um, you said at the beginning you did it with no click track. Um, how important is it for them to get their time foundation, you know, in their head before sure. they have to look at the click track being, you know, the vehicle for keeping them in time? Well, um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess we discovered that we could play together well, well enough to record some of this stuff. So, you know, um, and the producer having a second, you know, ear, that helped. But in the beginning, I mean, I practice with metronomes all the time. So I got, I got, a, I got a lock in my head, and I, and I still have that. You know, I still go back to it, too, and I reference our songs, and I reference live recordings, <clears throat> stuff like that, all the time, because we make re live recordings, and I hear, oh, man, you know, that one tempo's too fast, you know, I gotta go back and check that out. So it's very important to start with that bass. I mean, even if you don't wanna play to the click track the whole song, get that initial tempo, start the song, and then you can turn it off. I do that all the time. Um, so, but it's very important to get that, that tempo in your head and get that click track, get it locked in your head and practice that way with it. You know, I mean, because it's, it's very important. You have to practice not just playing a beat or playing like, you know, playing uh, rudiments, but you have to practice in a real situation. Like play your drum set, play your fills, and hear where you speed up or slow down. That's really important because that'll drive everybody nuts, <laughs> including yourself. Uh, in later years, um, was it more uh, predominant that you would have a click? Uh, pretty much you went in, it was, it was assumed that you were going to be playing to a click track? I wanted it because it, it helped me. Um, it, it just helped me to, you know, like time is money in the studio. I mean, it's like you can't, you got to do two or three takes and get, get on with it, you know. So um, it really helped me to, to kind of get in there and get it done. Because like, that's what you're doing. You're trying to put your, you know, put your emotion into the, the part, but you're also keeping time and it's all about the song. So, so um, that, that was so important for me to be able to go and go, I can play to this, I can do it. It's all about the sound of the click too. I mean, a lot of times, the sound of the clicks, like for Pro Tools, not not the best. So it'd be nice if you could come up with something that you that's playable, more more musical. Very important though. The click track's so important. Yeah, gotta have it. You get uh, called, as will happen to you from time to time, and you go on to an audition. Um, I remember there was one point when I was very young. A uh, bass player had me sit in with a group uh, with Nicky Sullivan, um, with the Crickets. It was a West Coast version after Buddy Holly had passed away. Wow. wow. And went, sat down, played the first song really great. I didn't know, and he didn't tell me, the audition was drummers who sing. So <laughs> That's right, they all three sang. So they, yeah, so, uh, so, and this was, I would have been the fourth harmony in this, because we had guitar, bass. Oh, there was four two, people. Two, yeah, two, two guitars and bass and me. I um, see, I see. So fortunately, they were used to the three because after I sang the first song, they decided they, they didn't need to have a drummer who sang. <laughs> so, so there's an easy way to get out of it. If you sing so bad, they just say, forget it. Don't. We'll hire That's you, funny. but whatever you do, don't sing. Yeah, uh, right. But uh, just keep but, time, sir. But, but, but it would be uh, uh, a real opportunity to be able to do both when you're out there, especially when we look at you know how much. Uh, Drummers have to learn and broaden their horizons with hybrid drum sets, learning percussion, learning all different styles in order to make a living today, being their own, what was to you back in those days, record label pretty much, because they yeah. had, to, had to be able to promote themselves and do everything. Absolutely, but absolutely. You, at, at, at one point, you know, you're a singer that plays drums or a drummer that sings and, and, and do both, but were you singing naturally and somebody just said, hey, you sound good? Or how did, you, how did you learn how to sing in the first place? And how would you encourage young drummers to, to get that opportunity? Well, I started, I started out doing both. I was kind of thrown into the fire, so to speak. So, so in the young bands that I started with, um, nobody could sing or not sing well. And I was always about the song when I, when I first started listening to music. So that was the first thing I latched on to was the vocal. So I started playing drums after I knew the songs, basically, from probably age seven on is when I latched on to Beatles and, you know, everything that was being uh, you know, popular in the early 60s throughout, you know. So I, 
I, I naturally learned how to play and sing at the same time. And I don't know how I did it back then. I mean, I think I, think I just had this passion to learn the, the song and to want to copy it. So in that way, I probably wasn't even playing well at all. But I think I was singing better than I was playing. So in that, in, in, in that way, I was probably like, I'm always a singer first and then a drummer. Because, you know, it's like I had to keep time. And the other guys are like reading their, their books. Oh, my, you know, this is my lesson this week. We're playing, you know, listen, mm, uh, all the Beatles stuff. So I, so I got thrown into that. The guy knew, knew, knew how to play it, but nobody was singing. So I just naturally sang. Perfect opportunity. Totally. Uh, something else you did that I remember from the first time I saw you that I was impressed with, um, and for two reasons. One, um, it gave a different flair to the fills that you played, and uh, and it was kind of a unique, you know, technique way of doing it, which is playing compound strokes. Could you play a couple of fills? By that, I mean, will you explain what I'm talking about? You're hitting two. Well, you two have to tell me what you mean by compound. Two, two, two tone colors at the same time. Oh, you, you mean play, like play like. Fills. <laughs> Like yeah. that. Right. Right. So hitting the, the, the drums at the same time. I mean, I, I always did that out of need, and out of out of need. What I mean by that is like, the song doesn't doesn't need this. It needs something like that. You know, or in a battle, you know. Something like that. So, I mean, that stuff is re really musical to me, you know, being a songwriter. So I always thought that the simple is better, especially in pop music. Yeah. It, it gives, it's interesting because it gives a unique sound of a high and a little more of an orchestral, you know, tone color range when you're it, playing both. And in a big arena, I mean, it really, you know, -da -bum -bum -bum. Oh, man. it's just like. I know, the, the simpler the better in, in bigger rooms, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I know plenty of drummers that can, can make things work in big arenas that play very fast. You know, I mean, Dean Casanova, for one. I mean, he, he makes that stuff sure. sound, sound big, but he's still playing fast, you know. But, I, but I was, my abilities were never, never like, like Dean's, you know. He's also a terrific singer, too. There's a good singer-drummer. Um, but I always liked the sound of the, the two tones, like with timpanis. You know, in an orchestra, how they how they they go, and I think that's like a note to me. I was trying to tune tune my drums that way so I can go, you know, boom, 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 boom. You know, and sometimes it's in the key of the songs. A lot of rock and roll songs are A E. You know, so I get I get my drum set to sound pretty close to those, and and sometimes. The snare drum is almost not playable because I like it tuned way down. Mm. Not in this case. Not today I didn't. I didn't do that. But I like it tuned boxy, so it. So in a big room, it's going to go. Bah! You know, it's just really going to sing, and really. Uh, in that come case, through. it's completely out of the range of the other. It's its own instrument. Totally. Where it is, right? Yeah. I mean, sometimes though, when you do get too low, you hit one of the toms, and the bottom takes off. So you gotta you gotta watch that. But but. Um, yeah, the tuning is very important too. I mean, I, for me, being a songwriter and, and being a singer, the drums have to have their own, they have to have their own space in, in the song, you know? I mean, so that, that to me, that's another way that I'm thinking in terms of being a singer, being a songwriter, and been, then being a drummer. It's like, how do the drums fit into the song, you know, like doing a fill going into the chorus? It's like, is it, does it sound like it's in, you know, because I've, I've been in situations where I, a tom rings and it's in a tone that's out of key of the song. And it'd be like, what is that tone? And I have to go in there and retune the drum, you know, sometimes, or dampen it so it doesn't ring out of key of the song. I mean, that's how I think, you know, so. No, that, um, that's a great tip, too. I mean, that's, that's really important information, I think, for, I think for, so. for drummers to hear, because these are the little subtle things in and out of the studio, even in a live situation. Totally. Um, and there it kind of brings back to your ability to play another instrument, which, what was your first instrument? Guitar. Was, guitar? Guitar and drums. Um, yeah, so I, I learned how to, you know, simple guitar, you know, just acoustic guitar, not electric. I play a little electric when I'm, when I'm writing songs, but I leave it to the pros, you know. But writing the song, that's, that's the whole thing is where I get my melodic, um, you know, my 
get my melodies and stuff like that is sit down with an acoustic guitar, figure it out, record it, you know, so. And the, the, the ability of you being a singer, I know I'm harping on that, but I think no, it, gets no. back, it gets back to the pitch. You're, you're in tune with, you're in tune, your drums are in tune, and you're in tune with the fact that your drums have to be at a certain pitch. Uh, That's always uh, been a thing for me. Like, from the first time I went into the studios, I always felt like it should be like a vocalist. You know, they should have their own place, and they sh should, sh should definitely, you know, uh, have a tone and a note. You know, so I always, I always try to do that. But being a vocalist, I mean, you know, I did hear those tones come out of the drums. You know, that was the first thing I, I noticed. It's like, wow, you know, I want to get that closer to where the key of the song is. So, so um, when you guys first came up with putting notes to the drums, I was, I was out of my mind with that. I was like, oh, my God, I can pick a drum set that's in the key of a lot of the rock songs that I play. You know? Interesting. Yeah, and you can tune them the heads to that particular note, or or, 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 or not. a third higher or a third lower, or wherever you That's want. That's right. But it yeah, is, the it great. It's just a it's a it's a starting point. Um, when you played a, a fill a little bit ago, there was a great degree of dynamics. Yeah. Um, and I mean, obviously, uh, your songs have that too. I mean, it's Sister Christian's obviously one that you know how to build. It starts yeah, that, off. that's right. I mean, that's. That's really what the drums play uh, their their huge role in, you know, in rock music is a, is about. There was a song called Seven Wishes, and it was like. High school, but I I love the dynamics between it. If you were to play that without dynamics, it wouldn't feel the, it swings the way you're playing it now. It it wouldn't swing at all. It, it, I mean, it's true. It's like um, I worry about that with electronic drums too. A lot of times, I when I get on electronic drums, I can't make them the dynamics that I like with drums. I mean, it's never gonna, probably never gonna be like that. But I think it's important. Dynamics are very important. You know, when you do fills like. <laughs> I like it to be like that. I like to breathe and you know, just like a vocal. You know, same thing. You you sing loud and you, you know you certain words you enunciate a certain way and you, it's all about the emotion, you know. I always have a sense when I hear you play some of those fills um, and talking to you now, thinking about how much you're listening to all the tones of the drums, yeah. your, your fill is almost like a background vocal group. Yeah. There, da -da -bum -ba -bum. You're, you're, just, you're, you're your own one-man band. <laughs> so, well, uh, I mean, that's the thing is that, is that um, when I first learned, if I didn't have any musicians around me, I would play and sing the songs by myself. You know, um, I didn't have a recording device back then, but I just, you know, w once you start doing something like that, you start to realize what you're doing and, and adjust and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's a good lesson. If you, if you know a song by heart, why not sit down, if you're a drummer and you want to sing, sit down and play it and sing it, and, but record it and, see, and hear how you're doing and just, you know, adjust that way. But I always thought, you know, the dynamics within a song have to be, you know, they have to be dicta dictated by the rhythm section, and that's the drums, bass, and keyboards or, or guitars, you know, the simple basic tracks, so. And, and when you, the, the process of writing a song, uh, do you start out thinking about the lyrics, thinking about something you happen to play on the drums, that did, is it, or is it each one somewhat unique? I, I think they're, they're pretty separate. When you're writing a song, it's all about finding the melody, the phrase, or a title, and then, and then you, you know, you embellish it from there. You go on from there, and, and it starts to grow. The beat, and w when you're a songwriter, the beat is just something to keep it going, but then you get more creative with it. And, and I'm, I've always been su super simple, so it's, sometimes I always feel like I'd like to have a, a drummer 
come in when I'm writing a song so he can, you know, he can interpret his, you know, like an outside ear. He could, because I'm always going to just go, I'm always going to go. You know, that's going to be me, you know, or. Those are, those, are, those are my two licks <laughs> that, I, that I'm going to use in every song. So. They've gotten you, that, that's one more than Chad Smith has. That's not bad. <laughs> I hey, love it. Hey. <laughs> uh, uh, and they work, right? They um, work. They work every time. Um, tried and true. Uh, thinking along the same lines, how do you think of the pitches of the cymbals relating to the drums and relating to the, the microphones? Well, um, as, far as, as far as that, I, I'm, I mean, I. I I hear the cymbals before I, when the mics go on there, I don't, I don't hear them, because, um, especially in the studio and live too. But um, yeah, I mean, that is, that is important because sometimes when you're, when you're in a soft part of the song, you don't want this to happen. You want that to happen, you know? So it, it does, you have to think about it, you know, if you're, if you're um, trying to create a song, um, and you get to certain parts dynamically. It's very important to think of, think about. You know, is it going to be, you know, or is it going to be, or, you know. So I mean, it's very important for young drummers to think about what they're playing. You know. I think a lot of them don't. You you see, it's a ride symbol. It's a crash symbol. You think, well, I just hit this one really hard, and I play this one when I play time. But uh, all the different nuances. We have several lessons. Uh, people just specifically showing all the different sounds you can get out of a cymbal. Oh my God! Uh, I mean, it's, just, and, it's and tremendous. Or, Look at Buddy Rich. A drum, yeah, exactly right. I mean, he was, yeah. I mean, he was, and I just saw something. Steve Smith did a cymbal solo, and that was it. He played no drums, and all he did was a cymbal solo. And I was, I was like, you know, when you hear somebody that really knows how to 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 play cymbals in that way, tr tr uh, it was a whole new way to look at cymbals. Yeah, you know, Steve is a consummate musician. There's no question about it. Yeah. Um, Incredible. And a lot of people think that Steve might be the first person to set his drum set sideways on a bandstand. However, you beat him by a few years. <laughs> I actually would be, as you set up with the band, I would be the audience in the way that That's you're, correct. That, you're yeah. that you're looking. Um, and how does that affect, you know, your placement of the drums and the cymbals and everything? You're singing. Um, you're always looking towards me most of the time because you're correct. singing yeah. as if you're the singer in the band. Um, that's yeah, the so reason that you put your drum set that way in the first place, I would gather, right? Well, I mean, the, the, we did it out of need back then. Um, we, were, we got asked to do a tour with Sammy Hagar, and there was no room. He had like a, a car on stage, you know. A and, real car. And, and that, yeah, it was like a, a Trans Am body, right? And, and that was one of his songs. And he had the car right where, right where, like, where the drum set would be over on the you know, stage left. You know? And I'm like, I'm like, oh my God. And originally, originally we did set, set up like this, so there would have been like four feet. You know? So me being a singing drummer, we, drummer we, we all thought about, well, I mean, how is anybody going to see, see the drummer sing? Don Henley did this. He just, he just didn't have a lot of cymbals, but if you look at some of those early, this cymbal right in his face, he's singing a lot of the songs. And I thought, I don't know, man. You know, it's like, how can we do this different? So that's what we did. We split up the keyboards and the drum risers and put the three guitar players in the middle. So I'm here, keyboards over there, and the three guys are in the middle facing that way. So that could be seen singing. But as far as the setup, the setup, was weird because all the guys are it was like mono at this point you know there everybody's just you know and we didn't have any or monitors back then so it was just about oh really it was all it was just about okay um, you know the guitar player over on that side and get and keyboard player how the heck are they gonna hear what I'm doing 30 feet away you know so what I had to do was I had to simplify my parts a lot I mean, because they were watching me. A lot of times they didn't hear me. They were just looking at me like this. They were like, and I'm doing this. I'm like, I'm like a metronome. You can see what I'm doing here, you know? So, and that's why my, my playing a lot of times is so simple. The only thing I would do from here is I'd go here, you know, and a fill, simply fill. But everything was like, so that was the weird thing about the way we set up back then. 
is that I remember Fitz, our keyboard player, he's always, he's always staring at me like this. And I would go, he goes, I can't really hear you. I'm watching you. You know, there would be a delay anyway, right? So, he, so that, was, that was the weird thing about our setup, you know? Your, uh, your actual individual drum set, though, as far as being able to be as if you were saying, practice your drums, but look this way yeah. in order to get used to this. Uh, I mean, you just I just got used to it for. I, I, I basically, I just, I just kind of like made it up as I go. I, I would change it. Sometimes I use headsets, and that didn't work because it sounded horrible, you know. So now I still, I use a, a wired mic, but I, I like the tones to, to just like, just like what the drums do. I like the tones to be different going across cymbals as well. So it's like, it's like. Do some accents like that with just cymbal as a pickup. I mean, you know, it's nice to have all those different tones. I use 20s, but I, I go from, from hand hammered to, you know, to AAX like that. But there are, you know, the tones are different, brilliant as opposed to, you know, uh, regular finish. And that was so, and I know you, you spent probably more time tweaking the drums, tuning them than most of the guys we have coming in here at Drum Channel because you knew what they're looking for. Play a little bit, if you would, maybe just some simple patterns just so drummers could hear the tonality of the cymbals and then mixing into the drums because it, yeah. it's such an orchestral scape. So I'll just like. And there's 100,000 people out there. I can hear them now. You'll hear, every, you'll hear every note. <laughs> uh, Got to say, also pay attention, uh, talking about different dynamic levels, your grace notes are perfectly, you know, they're really just anticipated. They're filling in that little space. They are, um, exactly. I do a lot of drags and a lot of yeah. that kind of stuff. You know. Then you've got everywhere from, from triple piano on up uh, with, with all of your fills. And I, I, I think it has to do with, you know, the musicality you have as a, as a result of being a singer. I guess I'm encouraging all you guys out there to really spend a little time, even if you're not singing well. You don't have to be the lead singer in the band, no, right? No, no. But, but consider the emotion, the, you know, the emotion that's going into a lead vocal. C consider your drum parts as, as emotional as a lead vocalist. I always, I always thought in terms of, like, you've got to add some soul into what you're playing. It's not just about speed, it's not about, it's not about volume, it's about dynamics, and it's about melodic, you know? That's what I think. Telling a story. Yeah, which is what exactly. You're, I mean, you're, you're, you're there to enhance the song, which is a lyric and a melody. So you should consider your drums to be a melodic instrument. You know? So we're running short on time here, but I, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us here today. And, um, mm -hmm. Going back to like maybe a, a, a drummer who has got his basic rock beats down and um, is getting, you know, he's got his time a little bit together, maybe an intermediate style, has never approached the idea of singing at the same time. Maybe an exercise for him to, would be to play that and then you're suggesting just learn a song yep. and sing it all the way through. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's going to be tough in the, in the beginning because the timing on both are, are a little different. So I think it's really important for all drummers, even if you're not going to be a singing drummer, to know this. You've got to know the song. So you should know the song, the lyrics, very important, and, and the melody. And so when you're playing, you've got to consider all those things when you're just keeping time. It's got to be more like, you know, you know. You accent it there, 
but you're not playing the same notes. So that, I mean, you gotta really consider the, mo the melody in the song, you know? I think you hit a key, record yourself. Because yeah, you're, love that, if, if, love if, that. That really works for me yeah. right now, too. And, and you'll probably find that either the song doesn't sound, you know, as, as rhythmic as, as it did if you didn't sing, and or the drumming gets a little bit choppy. So the idea is, it's independence, really. It's just the same thing you're doing with your two hands and your, and your feet. Exactly, I mean, it's like, you gotta be able to go. Sounds funny, but if you can go outside with your vocal and still keep time, then the key. you should be able to sing and play. Whatever is happening at the same time. <laughs> uh, and you are two instruments going at the same time, like your analogy with Frank Sinatra. Really think of your voice as an instrument. Um, and you do such a great job at that. So um, I appreciate check it. out, Thanks. you know, uh, anytime you have the opportunity to see the band playing live, obviously, and you'll see this happening in real time. You can say, I know how he did that. I figured that out. Uh, or, you know, on any of the recordings that you have. Uh, and I encourage you going back to some of the classic ones at the same time as uh, you can get some of the more of the newer ones. And you have your own project? You know, I've been doing uh, some R&B uh, project with, uh, with Bill Champlin, the great Bill Champlin. So I've been writing some songs with him because my first love was, was Motown. You know, I, when I came up, uh, before, you know, right, right around the, the Beatles era, Motown was huge then. So that was a big pull, like rock and roll pop or, or Motown and R&B. So, so we're, I'm getting to explore some of that and, and uh, having a great time with it. A big Chicago fan, I assume. Oh, yeah, uh, back huge. In the day. Um, I saw them at the Whiskey A Go-Go in 1969, so I was oh, a fan was, from them. That was the beginning of the beginning. It um, sure was. And I'm giving you the DVD we have of Danny Serafine. I don't think oh. you said you had that, which is a DVD Perfect, we have on the yeah. site. You should check that out while I'm thinking about it. It's a history of Danny and goes back through everything that they did back in the day. Uh, oh, that's and, great. And as we're winding this down, within two minutes, you could be watching another two hours of, uh, of the whole history of, of Danny and, and the band and his life. What and, a terrific and, drummer and, his, and, yeah, and, and a human being. He's a great and, guy. Too. And his, you know, and some, very interesting life stories, you know, when, when the bullet just barely missed his head, he decided he better become a drummer because the, the people he were hanging out with wasn't going to get him very far. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story he tells on there. Uh, I can't thank you so much for coming by, Kelly. Thanks, I Don. appreciate that so much. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Yes. I haven't we'll, seen you in should, 20 years it's, or so. It's been, it's been a while. Too <laughs> long. We'll, we'll do that. Right. And maybe get back here with some of the guys in your project and do some, do some playing with the band out here next time. That would time. be great. I would that love would to great. do that. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think we might be in, uh, we might go to the House of Blues. I think the House of Blues is in Anaheim. Gig, yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, coming well, up. Definitely I'll let you know. Whenever you're around, yeah. <laughs> and thank you. Check out everything else we have here on Drum Channel. Uh, it's a, a whole bunch of information, not only education, but entertainment also. So you can either practice or you can just hang out, So, which is what we're going to do now. Thanks again, Kelly. See you again Thanks. soon.